I recently made a video on the Strangler pattern which provides a safer incremental migration path by allowing new microservices to gradually strangle the monolith without significant changes to the existing code base. Service decomposition focuses on breaking down the monolith based on logical boundaries and business domains, often involving direct refactoring. In today's video, we'll explore why breaking down monolithic systems through service decomposition is essential for modern software development. We'll explore key strategies for breaking down monoliths and look at how companies like Netflix and Spotify use service decomposition to achieve scalability, resilience, and faster innovation. As your application expands, sticking with a monolithic architecture can create significant challenges. In a monolith, all functions are tightly coupled with a single code base, which leads to several issues. Think of a monolithic application like a giant machine with interconnected parts. If one part malfunctions, you must take the entire machine offline to fix it. As the machine gets bigger, fixing even small issues become increasingly complex and scaling it is cumbersome and expensive. Service decomposition is the process of identifying and extracting these smaller services from the monolith. But how do you effectively decompose a monolith? That's where the service decomposition pattern comes into play. When it comes to service decomposition, there are several strategies that can help structure your microservices effectively, each with its own set of benefits. First, you can decompose by business capability. This means breaking down services based on core business functions. For example, in an e-commerce platform, you might have separate services for inventory management, order processing, payment, and shipping. The key benefit? This approach aligns services with your organizational structure, making it easier for teams to own and manage their specific areas of expertise. An advanced and effective strategy is to decompose by subdomains, which is a concept from domain-driven design. This approach allows you to handle complexity by organizing your system around business domains, ensuring that each service has clear boundaries and specific business logic. In DDD, we use the idea of bounded context to divide our system into smaller, more manageable areas. A bounded context represents a specific part of your business domain with its own language and logic. For example, instead of having a single payment service, we might break it down into smaller services like invoice processing and transaction management, each focused on its own task. This approach helps reduce complexity and keeps the business logic clear and isolated. And if you are new to the idea of DDD, do not worry. I'll cover it in more depth in an upcoming video where we'll explore how to effectively use bounded context and DDD principles. An alternative approach is to decompose by use case or user journey. For instance, think of the checkout process on an e-commerce platform. In this approach, services are designed around specific user interactions or workflows. A dedicated checkout service would handle everything from card validation to payment and order confirmation. The main benefit here is that the services are optimized for performance during critical user pathways, enhancing the overall user experience. Lastly, you can decompose by resource. This involves creating services around entities that perform create, read, update, and delete operations. For example, a product catalog service would manage all operations related to product information. This method simplifies data management and aligns your services closely with underlying database structures. Each of these strategies, whether based on business capabilities, subdomains, user journeys, or resources, offers distinct advantages. As you decompose your monolith into microservices, managing them efficiently is key. Tools like Kubernetes and Istio are essential for this. Kubernetes automates the deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications, ensuring your services can scale based on demand without manual intervention. I'll be doing a deep dive on Kubernetes in an upcoming video, so stay tuned for that. For managing service communication, Istio, a service mesh, offers traffic management, security, and observability across services. I've covered this in detail in my previous video on service mesh. It allows you to route traffic intelligently and ensure availability even if some services fail. By using Kubernetes and Istio, you are not only simplifying microservices orchestration, but also gaining visibility into service performance and ensuring robust security between services. These tools take care of the operational complexities, allowing you to focus on delivering features faster and with greater confidence. When approaching service decomposition, it is crucial to follow some key best practices to ensure success. Start small by breaking down non-critical components first. This allows your team to gain hands-on experience without affecting core functionalities. Clearly define the boundaries of each service by leveraging domain models and aligning with business capabilities, ensuring each service has distinct purpose. Embrace automation to simplify the complexity. 
automating testing, deployment, and monitoring will make your process more efficient. Collaboration across teams is essential to manage the interdependencies that arise in microservices architecture. So keep communication channels open and active. And remember, service decomposition is an ongoing process. Continuously assess and refine your services to keep up with evolving business needs and technological advancements. Netflix, serving millions of users worldwide, needed an architecture that could support rapid feature releases and high availability. Behind this effortless user experience lied a complex technological evolution. A journey from monolithic system to a cutting-edge microservices architecture through the power of service decomposition. Let's rewind to the early 2000s when Netflix was a DVD by mail service with a relatively straightforward technological setup. As the company grew and ventured into the streaming media, their monolithic application began to show cracks under the pressure of rapid expansion and increasing user demands. The monolithic system was a single unified code base where all functionalities were tightly interwoven. This architecture made it difficult to implement new features, scale specific components or recover quickly from system failures. Any change, no matter how small, required redeploying the entire application, a risky and time-consuming process. And recognizing these limitations, Netflix embarked on a transformative journey to decompose their monolithic application into microservices. Netflix's shift to service decomposition wasn't just about breaking down their system. It was about empowering teams to own specific services and innovate quickly. For example, their recommendation service became a standalone microservice, allowing teams to rapidly innovate, run experiments, and improve the user experience without disrupting other parts of the system. In the recommendation service, for instance, by isolating it, Netflix could innovate rapidly, deploying advanced algorithms and A-B testing new features without impacting other parts of the system. This agility resulted in highly personalized content suggestions, keeping users engaged and satisfied. By decoupling services, Netflix achieved unparalleled scalability. During peak hours or the release of a popular show, only the necessary services scaled up to handle the load, optimizing resource utilization and reducing cost. Resilience was another significant gain. In a microservices architecture, if one fails, say the billing service, the rest of the system continues to function. Users can still browse and watch content while the issue is resolved, enhancing overall reliability. Service decomposition also allowed Netflix to embrace technological diversity. Teams could choose the best tools and languages suited for the specific service. Some services adopted Java, other Node.js or Python. And databases range from Cassandra to MySQL, each optimized for particular needs. And to ensure robustness, Netflix introduced Chaos Monkey, a tool that intentionally disrupts services in their production environment. This might sound counterintuitive, but by simulating failures, they strengthen the system's ability to handle real-world issues gracefully. Today, Netflix serves over 200 million subscribers worldwide, streaming billions of hours of content each month. And this success is in part thanks to the strategic implementation of service decomposition. Netflix's journey illustrates the transformative power of breaking down complex systems into manageable independent services. Service decomposition not only solved their immediate challenges, but also paved the way for innovation, scalability, and resilience. Another great example of service decomposition comes from Spotify, a company that serves millions of users with real-time music streaming. As Spotify scaled rapidly, their initial monolithic architecture couldn't keep up with user demand and the need for frequent feature releases. In the early days, Spotify's architecture was monolithic, with tightly coupled components handling everything from users' playlists to music recommendations. The structure made it difficult for teams to work independently. Changes in one part of the application could easily impact other parts, slowing down development and deployment. And to solve these bottlenecks, Spotify embraced service decomposition, breaking down their monolith into smaller, more manageable microservices. And each of these microservices were designed around specific business capabilities, like the playlist management, recommendation algorithms, or music delivery. This allowed individual teams to own and manage their respective services, improving both productivity and agility. For instance, the playlist service became its own microservice. This allowed Spotify engineers to iterate quickly and adding new features like collaborative playlists and personalized recommendations without affecting other parts of the system. Like Netflix, Spotify also benefited from independent scaling. So during peak usage, such as when a new album drops or user floods with platform for a major event, Spotify can scale only the services that needs it, like the music streaming service. This prevents over-provisioning and ensures efficient resource use. Another key benefit of service decomposition at Spotify was the ability to experiment and innovate. By isolating services, Spotify could also run A-B tests on specific features without worrying about the impact on the entire application. For example, 
The recommendation service could test new algorithms to improve song suggestions, leading to more personalized and engaging user experiences. And today, Spotify runs hundreds of microservices, each responsible for a specific function of their platform. This microservices architecture has enabled them to scale globally while continually innovating and adding new features.